Stephen, I'm going to admit something to you that is uh, sometimes a little dangerous among my philosophical and scientific friends. Even though I did a doctorate in brain science, neurophysiology, I still cannot reject the possibility that there is something non-physical that we need to make a brain into a mind. I know you're going to disagree with me. I, I well, not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, this is one of the, you know, the great philosophical puzzles, precisely how mind and brain relate to each other. Are they the same thing? Are they distinct things that somehow causally interact? Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, there would appear to be a pretty good argument for why the mind has to be physical. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with the argument. It's The argument is that um, when we trace back the, the physical causes of uh, events out there in the universe and within our own bodies, we find that each effect has a physical cause. That's how the universe works. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of causally closed system. And if that's true, and minds are not physical, then the, mi the mind is locked out, causally speaking. The mind will not be able to have any physical effect within the physical domain because everything is already fully taken care of and determined by how you know, the antecedent physical situation and the laws of nature. So it looks as if, if that's how the physical universe works, that if minds aren't physical, minds can't have any physical effect. And yet, obviously they do, we want to say, because look, there you go, <laughs> I'm waving my arm around. And that's a physical effect, and my mind is doing it. I made a conscious decision to do it, and, and there we go. Um, so there's that kind of argument for why mind mentality, if you like, the mind has to be physical. But on the other hand, there is this deep intuition, with which I have you know, some sympathy in which you articulated there, some, that, that there's, there's something about the mind that couldn't possibly be physical. But the, the, the hard bit, really, is in articulating in, you know, precisely what it is about the mind that, that entails that it couldn't be physical. Well, I think there are two ways to look at this, and you, you've, you've said it well. From If you believe that there is something non-physical, which many religious people do, and, and, some, and some philosophers, uh, not most, then you have this problem of how can something non-physical interact with the physical world when the physical world seems to be a closed system. That's an absolute problem that those people have. On the other hand, when you look at all the things that brains are, electrical impulses, uh, uh, chemicals floating across synapses between the neurons, um, that is not about things. That may represent things, but it, it, it seems like such a different character mm. that, that mind and consciousness and our inner sense of awareness seems like, like one can affect the other, but cannot possibly be the same thing. Yeah. So basically, you have deep problems on both sides. But there is one answer, which you, know, <laughs> you and I are not going to find, but it's important to dissect out the issues. Yeah. What is the answer? I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, what, what you were articulating there uh, was an intuition about the mind that it just couldn't be physical. And the, we need to sharpen that up a bit because, I mean, at the moment, all we're really saying is, gee, it doesn't seem physical, does it? <laughs> right? Yeah, right, right, right. From the inside, this, this experience that I'm having right now, it doesn't feel like a brain state. Um, and, and you said, look, this brain state, it couldn't be about anything. Well, I mean, this is just begging the question. I mean, may, maybe that brain state is a thought, in which case it is about something. It's just that you didn't realize that. Maybe this experience that I'm having right now is a brain state. It's just that I, I didn't, it doesn't seem that way, but that doesn't mean that that isn't what it is. I mean, our science is constantly revealing. That, Certainly there's that a things, huge, that things that, that seem, you know, so to take a glass of water. It doesn't seem like a vast collection of hydrogen and oxygen <laughs> atoms put together in a particular kind of way, but that's just what it is. Appearances are deceptive, and it may be that that's the case in this case. So that argument says that out of these electrical impulses, these nerves, that there's some sort of an emergent, different kind of phenomena, the, the analogy being when H2O comes together and it has water, it has li it, it's liquid and has a sh does things, and so, so it's not something you can predict from one to the other. I mean, 
Doesn't it seem, though, that the nature of our inner experience is, is of such a different character that such a, a, a simplistic um, physical analogy just doesn't work? Yeah, well, that, that's certainly, you know, I have that feeling about it, right? That there's something there, if only I could just articulate it clearly and precisely, that you know, I could show that this couldn't possibly be something physical. But boy, it's hard, it's hard to do that. Um, I mean, there are, various, uh, there are various attempts that have been made, um, and some have been maybe a little bit more successful than others. One is to appeal to knowledge. So, for example, some philosophers say, we could find out everything there is to know about what's going on in your brain right now, down to the, you know, the last synapse. We could get all of that information. And yet, we would never know what it's like for you, the subject, to have a, you know, the experience that you're having right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th th there's a further fact there that some, you know, suppose, you know, I'm, I'm colorblind. I don't know what it's like to have color experiences. You're having a color experience. I find out all of the facts about what's mm -hmm. going on in your head. I'm still not going to know what it's like to have a color experience. So there's an extra fact, you see, on top of the physical facts. So we've established a kind of du du dualism of facts at the very least. Um, so there's that kind of knowledge argument, um, which on the face of it looks quite plausible. But, you know, there are no, you know, notoriously, there are problems about using knowledge to establish, you know, that things are not identical. I mean, you might know that Elton John sang Rocket Man, but you may not know that Reginald Dwight sang Rocket Man. Um, does it follow from the fact that you know one thing but don't know the other thing? that Reginald Dwight is not Elton John. No, it doesn't. He is. It's his stage name of uh, Reginald Dwight. Yeah. Um, what people know about things, you know, it's not, generally speaking, a reliable indicator of what's identical or not identical with what. So knowledge arguments are quite popular, but you know, notoriously unreliable. So overall, how do you look at the uh, potential requirement of something beyond the brain to explain the mind? Well, it's not clear to me that that there are more positions on the table than than we've looked at so far. People often think that well, there are, you've got two options here. You've either got to kind of go for a soul, or some something like that, um, or you've got to say that the mind is the brain, and that's it. There are other positions we could look at. Um, you could be an eliminativist, an eliminative materialist. You could simply deny that there's any such thing as the mind. You could, and this is the view that I'm personally most sympathetic to, you could say that to have a mind is to have a rich repertoire of abilities and publicly observable stuff is what minds consist in. Um, it's a mistake to identify minds with souls, but it's also a mistake to identify minds with brains, actually. Um, maybe having a mind is a bit like being soluble. Take a sugar cube, it's soluble, right? And what does its being soluble consist? That if you place it in a glass of water, it will dissolve. That's, that's all that there is to being soluble. Now, the sugar cube has a certain microstructure, a certain chemical composition, which causally explains why it dissolves when it's placed in water. But you mustn't identify solubility with the, the chemical structure that's inside the sugar cube. Even if, miraculously, it, you know, suppose it didn't dissolve when you placed it. You know, there's something weird about this one. Uh, it, 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 you know, the laws of nature are suspended in this case. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't dissolve. Is it, then it's not soluble. The fact that it has the right microstructure is irrelevant. Okay? So similarly, it may be that to have a mind is to have various publicly observable stuff going on. Um, yeah, this is the sugar cube. This is the chemical stuff that's going on. It's, it's causally important. Without a brain, this ain't going to happen, causally speaking. But don't identify minds with brains. They're, they're not brains any more than solubility is kind of should be identified with the chemical structure of the, the sugar cube.